All right, we are live in the Facebook group now. So come over to our meet and I'm screen sharing. Um, and thank you guys for being here who is in the contract class. One more time, I'm just gonna say for the Facebook recording and anybody who jumps onto Facebook, this is a basic class. So if you do feel like you don't need it, feel free to jump off or fast forward to whatever part you really wanna hear about. First thing we're gonna do is quickly go over to one to four. Um, just some of the issues that I'm seeing more and more agents kind of presenting on their contracts as they're turning them in. And then really we're going to focus our time on the addendum, which is going to be the third party financing addendum, the HOA addendum, and the appraisal addendum. All right, we'll jump right in. So let me present to my Google Meet people. Okay, fun stuff. Alrighty. One to four family contract. Again, we're gonna go really, really fast. If you have a question, unmute yourself. I can't see you, okay? Uh, parties to the contract are your seller and your buyer. Make sure you're using a legal name. If they are an investor and they're using a um, investor name, like a business name, Sage Street, Sage Street Realty LLC, that's fine. Make sure you put um, the LLC or the full name that it is, you know, like in the Texas workforce, however it's filed with Texas. Um, however, they cannot, the buyer cannot sign as their LLC. So Sage Street Realty LLC cannot sign Sage Street Realty LLC. I, Renee Anderson, as the owning member of Sage, uh, Sage Street Realty LLC, have to sign the contract as Renee Anderson, managing member. Okay, keep that in mind. Uh, lot block, this is all very standard. Lot block, the description, county known as, that's the address. <clears throat> Exclusions. Guys, if your sellers want to exclude anything, make sure that you're putting it in MLS in the exclusions because that's where everybody grabs it from. Um, vice versa, if you're a buyer and they have exclusions in the exclusion section in MLS, make sure to list that here. Okay, sales, sales cash portion, sales price. So this is gonna be what they put down. Make sure you're checking with their lender and you have the accurate number. So they're gonna put 20% down. That's totally different than putting 3.5% down. Make sure you know that because this should be as accurate as possible, okay? Um, yes, you have to do math here. I know it sucks, but there's a little calculator. So just subtract the sales price minus their cash price and figure it out yourself. Third party financing addendum, make sure you're checking that if they have a third party you know, financing and if they're gonna get any kind of financing. Um, loan assumption is not happening right now, but if that ever comes across your books, please give me a call first. Same with seller financing. They work totally differently and title has to do a lot more work. Leases, this is the big change on the contract. So instead of it asking if you have a relation to the seller or buyer, section four is now leases. So if there's a residential lease, this does not mean you need a seller lease back or a buyer lease back. This is, I own a home, I have a renter in the property. Then I may need to, I, I might have a lease that's already intact. Then I would put, you know, check this box because there's already a lease. And then we have to fill out this addendum regarding residential leases. Fixtures would include um, propane tanks, solar plant panels. These are the things you're gonna see the most of. Um, water softener, security system. If there's any kind of like leased materials. So solar panels, usually don't buy them because they're like, $80,000, you just rent them from the company uh, and you have a monthly payment on those. That would be a lease, a fixture lease. Um, same thing with your security system. Some people don't actually buy all the cameras and stuff. They just um, have to have you know, security with that particular company in order to get the system for free. So that would be something you need to, you know, you would put here in fixture leases. Natural resource lease, we're not gonna see that as much unless you are doing um, land or farm and ranch. So if you come across that, please give me a call and we will go over that together. Earnest money and termination money, another big change in the contract. So instead of having termination paragraph 23, like it used to, everything's in paragraph five. So remember that earnest money and option fee can be one check and you're gonna deliver it to name your title company as escrow agent. Do not put a person's name. It's okay if you have a preferred person at that 
company, you know, Tiago Title Dash Sean, Tiago Title Dash Michelle. I've seen that done, that's fine, but make sure you put Tiago Title because if you put somebody else's name um, first before the title company, they're legally required to close this contract, okay? So just keep that in mind that that's an amendment you have to do and it's a real headache to get everybody to sign once you're pretty far into the contract. I'm sure most of you have dealt with that before. So title company as escrow agent at 123 Main Street, make sure you're putting the address there. Um, and then you're putting the money amount. So your earnest money is usually, usually not standard, not anything like that, but usually 1% of the contract amount. Um, obviously people are raising that amount to be more uh, competitive, that's fine. So earnest money there. And this second blank here is your option fee. Okay, so that's gonna be where you put your 100 to, I've seen them up to $1,000 now to take the property off as option. If you're not gonna put an option, so your client is waiving the option, don't leave this part blank, okay? Push the space bar, it turns your spot green, and then put zero in there. Or type the word zero, okay? Don't leave this blank, guys. Blanks are bad in contracts because they're legally binding documents. Um, and then number one, buyer shall deliver additional earnest money. That's usually gonna be a zero. Again, click the space bar and put zero. Okay, that's, that's how um, zip forms works because obviously you can only put numbers in this space. So if I try to write the word zero, nothing happens. But if I click space, it turns green and then I can write the word zero, okay? Um, within however many days of the effective date of the contract. That's if you're doing additional earnest money. Most people don't do that. Um, there are certain situations where that would happen uh, depending on uh, improvements at the beginning, you know, like you already see things, or, you know, they're putting like a really big chunk of money, earnest, earnest money down just to get it off the market. So there are different scenarios where this could be a great way to negotiate. Um, but don't do it if you don't know what you're doing, if you don't know if it fits the situation, call me first and we'll talk it through, okay? Paragraph B is termination options. So even though the termination money is listed here, paragraph B talks, talks about your termination time period. So whether it's one day or 10 days, that's how many days you put there, okay? And take note that it's at 5 p.m. that day, not midnight, okay? All right, title and survey. Um, make sure that you're checking, is it gonna be a seller's paid for the survey or a buyer's paid for the survey? And it has to be issued by the title company you're closing with, okay? Are they gonna amend? Or, um, will it not be amended or deleted from the title policy if there's any you know, printed exceptions as to the discrepancies, conflicts, shortages in the area or boundary lines, encroachments or protrusions or overlapping improvements? So overlapping improvement would be like a fence. Maybe a fence like isn't perfectly straight and it's kind of sideways and it overlaps two different properties. Would you amend that survey or would you delete it um, because it, short is, it shorts your client's property? That's a conversation you have to have with your clients, guys. Don't just assume that they're not gonna do anything. Um, if, and then a lot of times, especially in this market, if you're repping the buyer, if they want to make sure they're getting every piece of land or they wanna say that there's a shortage in their area because they don't wanna pay for it tax-wise, just have them buy, have the buyer pay for it if there's an issue, okay? Um, that way that it still looks competitive, but you're taking care of your client. Don't assume on this. Um, that's a, talk to your client about it, okay? And if you have questions, let me know. Survey, I'm not gonna really go over this, nothing new there, but keep in mind that if you do use a current survey, one that's been, you know, had by the previous owner, you need to have a T47 notarized. If, you, if your clients can't get a notary, make sure you contact one of the notaries in our office. So Nikki's one, Nadine is one, I think Marcy's got a notary. Um, contact one of them, I'm sure they'll do it for a reasonable price for a client, okay? Um, objections, this is if they're gonna object to anything, any kind of activity, this'll be in the title commitment, so you can always ask. But stuff like this would be, you're not allowed to run a business in your home based on the HOA documents or there's restrictions on the deed that say you can't have um, 
a daycare in your in your property so you want to make sure that they have you know if they're going to do something besides just live in the property you would list that here that way we know and that you have time to object to it once you get all the documents the commitment the exemptions all the surveys and stuff within however many days give your buyer some time to read through those documents because if they do plan on running a business out of their home that's not just like an office and virtual um, where they're gonna have people or kids or stored you know uh, property then then make sure that you give them enough time to read through their documents okay uh, member and owners association we're gonna talk about this more later but make sure you know if it is or is not in a member association okay don't just assume because again that can get you in a little bit of trouble um, and cost you money sellers disclosure check uh, MLS before you just say buyer has not received the notice okay because sometimes those sellers are uploading them they're not even going to consider your offer if you put that you didn't receive it and they have three days to deliver it to you okay so pay attention to that um, let's see property condition make sure that you're explaining to your client that as is means that you're gonna you're you still have option time or is as is means as is because you waived option okay so make sure you're explaining these two options to them um, if they walk in they see the pool pump doesn't work and that's like a huge make it or break it for them don't check as is still check buyer accepts property as is provided and then put some whatever treatment you want in there, okay? Because that can get you in trouble as well. They walked in, it was clear that the pump didn't work, it was on the seller's disclosure, the pump didn't work, you put as is, there can be a fight there. Um, all right, residential services contracts. You guys can use whoever you want to. We don't get any kind of reimbursement, but do keep in mind that Christine does a lot with us. So if you can, talk her up. Their services now that they changed to, what's this new company called? home serve home warranty they actually do even more and the prices are even better so if for whatever reason you're you know getting a home warranty for your buyers um, make sure that you talk with Christine about that a little bit okay um, broker and sales agents guys if you are related to in any way your client please list it here disclose 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 okay even if they're your third cousin four times removed it's better to say something than not to okay um closing on or before on or before always try and like get your closing date the most accurate as possible because title and lenders um calculate taxes that are going to have to be credited or paid for based on this date but keep in mind that it means it says on or before you do not have to amend the contract if your closing date's on the 15th and you want to close on the 10th you only amend it if it closing dates on the 15th and you need to close on the 20th okay possession um, obviously this is happening a lot upon closing and funding is not according to a temporary residential lease back is because everybody's just selling and it's frantic so if you have a lease back make sure that you're filling that out correctly if you don't know what you're doing please call me first and if you get one because you're the seller's agent and you don't understand it um, call me we'll talk through it and we can go from there we won't be discussing that particular document today settlement and other expenses this is at, if your buyer is FHA or VA they can ask for money back from you to help pay for some of their closing costs your seller I mean so uh, keep that in mind if you guys have any you know people who need help with their closing costs that does not necessarily take you out of the running for an, for a, a contract I'm not gonna lie it doesn't help if you have that there but um, I mean I've been in a crazy market and got my client six thousand dollars back it just depends on what you're you know offering and sometimes they just don't have a whole bunch of open cash but they make a lot of money you know so, so not everybody saves as good as everybody else um, let's see all of this is promulgated so I'm not gonna go over it notices um, this is what I always do just because I like to be in the loop always put your seller's name at the top and I, in the second line, I put CC and then my email address. Let's see if I can stop. Like that. Because I want to know that any notice that's sent to my seller is copied over to me. 
that way I can help explain it to them. Uh, perfect example, I just had a seller who had the seller's information sheet sent to them from Title. Freaked out, Title didn't loop me in, and so I had to go and pick up these seller's forms because they didn't want to email their social security number over to Title. So, I always put my stuff in here because I'd like to be connected on everything and let them know it's not a scam. We're all being scammed these days, so everybody's scared of everything. Uh, this is the seller's phone number, the seller's email, and the other seller's email if there's two of them. Okay, nobody has a fax anymore, let's be real. Agreement to parties. Uh, this is the addendums that you would use. So third party financing addendum, um, if there's an HOA, if there's uh, a seller lease back, um, if the house was built before, you know, 1978, you might have a uh, lead-based paint addendum, um, hydrostatic testing. Guys, this can hurt the plumbing of the house, so you have to get authorization from the current seller to do this if your buyer wants to do it, okay? And then this is the other big one, addendum concerning right to terminate due to lender's appraisal, okay? Um, attorneys, most people don't have an attorney, so you can leave that blank. Executed date. The last person to sign this document executes the contract. So if you represent the seller, the buyer submits the offer to you. You as the seller's agent have your sellers sign and if there were no changes made on the contract, you execute. Now, if the buyer's agent submits the contract to you, the offer, your sellers sign it except for you change the title company and your sellers also initial your change on the title company the buyer then has to initial the change. So it cannot be executed because that's not the last signature, okay? So then you have to send it back to the buyer's agent. The buyer's agent will have their, his client initial that change of title and that buyer's agent will execute the contract, okay? So the last signature executes the contract. It says broker to fill in the date. You guys, you have my authorization to sign as a broker's agent and anything that says, you know, broker, like including effective dates. Uh, so keep that in mind. And then the last page, broker information, fill this out completely. It's very rude to send a contract that's not completely filled out, okay? And this page, title needs it, and it sucks when you get the contract and it doesn't just like have these little blinks in it. You have to drag and drop, okay? Be considerate of other people's times. It's faster for you to go back and forth and get the information. Broker fee. This, MLS dictates it. So if MLS says you're getting 1% and you decide to put 3% here, you don't get 3%. You still get 1%, okay? Pay attention to what MLS says. You don't, you don't get to dictate it. MLS is the final say. And there is no standard commission in the state of Texas. So if it doesn't offer you 3%, remember you're working for your clients and not your commission, okay? If it's the best house for them, do it. You never know how much more deals you'll get from that one person because you took care of them okay um, and then all of this stuff is receipts make sure that it's being receipted everywhere um, title actually receipts option fee and earnest fee now okay um, let's see so that's it any questions on the one to four fantastic we're gonna move on and we're gonna look at the third party fin financing addendum I'm going to quickly go over this one as well. Make sure that you put the street address and the city at the top of this. The reason being is sometimes they get separated, you know, or um, they're sent in separate documents instead of one document. They just need to be able to find it just in case, okay? Make sure you're choosing the correct financing. Is it conventional financing? Texas Veteran Loan is not the same as VA guaranteed financing, okay? So if you don't know what your client has, it's most likely they have VA guaranteed. A Texas veteran loan doesn't happen very often um, anymore. They do have them, but keep in mind that this is very rare. And if you see a loan status like this, call the lender and just double check, okay? FHA financing, USA, uh, USDA financing, and reverse mortgage financing. You're not gonna see many of these, but really you're gonna see mostly conventional and uh, FHA. So conventional loan is, you're checking either number one, first mortgage, or one and two for a first mortgage and a second mortgage. Um, you put the amount, this number is gonna be the financed amount. So again, number, 
uh, paragraph two in our contract, or is it paragraph three now? Paragraph two in our contract, remember it said cash portion and then there was a financed portion and a sales price. The financed portion is what you'll put here, okay? Um, excluding any financed PMI premium do uh, in full in, it's usually gonna be 30 years, but it, you ask the lender if you're not sure if maybe they did a 15 year note, um, it may be 15 years instead of 30 years with the interest not to exceed. So if today's interest is 2.85%, put 3% here because you don't know that it won't go up in the next you know couple of days before they lock their rate in. So it has to be an attainable loan. If you put at a rate of 2% and rates are already at 2.5%, your buyer could back out because they don't get a 2%. You see how that's dangerous on the sell side? So make sure you're just putting attainable loans that way, especially experienced agents, they pay attention to this to make sure it's an attainable loan. Per annum for the next 30 years again, unless it's a 15 year note, um, of the loan with origination charges shown on the buyer's loan estimate for a loan not to exceed blank percent of the loan. So origination charges should not exceed 2% of the loan as of right now, okay? Um, if that changes for some reason and lenders are start to charge 3%, can charge up to 3%, then I'll let you guys know. But as of right now, it's still a CFPB requirement that they can't exceed 2%, okay? Um, if they have a second mortgage, that doesn't happen very often, but if they do, it's the exact same. You just have to fill it out, whatever that amount is going to be. So um, it doesn't happen very often. If it does and you get confused, call the lender. You can call me. I can help you fill this out, but the lender is the one that knows all about the money, okay? Don't try to be an expert in what we're not experts in. FHA, I'm going to jump down to FHA because that's the next one that you're going to see. A section 203B, that's the FHA loan that people are giving, 203B. Not less than, again, the financed amount. And actually on um, FHA, ask the lender if they require this. Sometimes they require it to say the purchase amount, okay? Amortize monthly for not less than, they're always 30 years, they don't have an option of a 15 year note with interest not to exceed, do higher, okay? So if it's 2.8, on a conventional, you might have put three, you may put 3.5% per annuum, annuum here, or maybe even 4%. Um, you can always ask their lender how much percentage theirs is looking at, and then add at least a quarter of a percent to that. Uh, for the first 30 years with origination loans, not to exceed, again, 2% of the loan. That's still a standard number. Same thing with VA guaranteed. So their VA has to appraise because they're 100% financing for the sales price. So that will always be the sales price, even if they're putting down payment, okay? Um, amortized for 30 years, VA loans are 30 years, uh, not to exceed. I always put 4% unless we're already over 4%, but right now I would put 4% on the VA per annuum for 30 years, and again, 2% on the, on the percentage of their origination fees. Okay, we're gonna skip USDA and reverse mortgage because it's just barely happening and then go into approval. Okay, this is a negotiation tactic, okay? People are looking at this. So most of you are gonna represent buyers who maybe aren't completely approved, but read this paragraph. It says, this contract is subject to a buyer obtaining a buyer approval. Let's read that sentence again. This contract, or this contract is subject to the buyer obtaining buyer approval. If buyer cannot obtain buyer approval, buyer may give written notice to the seller within blank amount of days of the effective date of the contract and the contract will terminate and the earnest money will be refunded to the buyer. Okay, I'm, I read that first sentence multiple times because this does not include um, appraisal, okay? So you don't need to put enough days to cover your appraisal here. So if you're putting 21 days in today's market, nobody's gonna accept your contract because you're giving yourself too long to back out, okay? Your buyers should be approved. Your buyers should be almost approved enough for you to waive this. However, don't take the chance if they're not, you know, if they're still turning in some of their documentation, but they should be approved enough that they only need a couple more days, five, 10 more days to finish their approval. 
okay? And really, should you be working with a buyer who hasn't obtained full approval on their particular situation financially? No, you shouldn't be, not in this market. It's too crazy, okay? So like a conditional approval from a lender, not worth it. They need to be approved. This means the buyer has to obtain buyer approval. Me, myself, my own credit, my own job, my own situation, I can be approved within 10 to 15 days. I wouldn't put more than 10 to 15 days in here, okay? Not the appraisal. The appraisal gives you a completely different out unless you waive that. Okay, or if your buyers are very approved, like no issues at all, they're very set, they have lots of money, they, you know, you work with them all the time, they've bought 12 houses from you, buy and sold, um, you may be able to waive this. This contract is not subject to the buyers obtaining buyer approval. Do not check this box if you are not 118% sure, okay? But uh, definitely speak with their lender, that's how you'll know. FHA requirements, you only have to fill this provision out if you're FHA or VA, and this basically talks about the appraisal, like it has to appraise for what the lender is willing to uh, lend on, otherwise they'll, they'll do less, okay? Remember that your FHA buyers and your VA buyers can waive appraisal, it's different, um, and verbiage is going to be put in a different place, but it doesn't matter. The loan will still only loan to whatever amount is in this number, is in this page, okay? Um, and I can show you how to waive this, but we'll, we'll talk about it when we get to the appraisal waiver. All right, and that's it. Make sure everybody signs, and we're done with the third-party financing addendum. Any questions on third-party financing? What is a good question to ask with regards to like, because uh, sometimes I hear it's gone through underwriting, but mm -hmm. it has not. Is that something that we can ask the lender? Yes. Okay, so um, Jose just asked on the third party financing addendum as the seller's agent, what can you ask to make sure it's a strong third party financing addendum? Can you ask if it's gone under un, into underwriting? A lot of times lenders won't submit to underwriting until they have the property but they would have, they can. So it just depends. Ask the lender, get on the phone, whether you're the seller's agent or the buyer's agent. If you have questions about their third party financing, ask them, have you guys started underwriting on this file? How certain are you about this buyer? What have they turned into you? Do you know that their job, income, debt is looking good enough to purchase this property at this price? You can ask whatever question you want to, okay? If they legally cannot answer it, they'll tell you we legally can't answer that, but the only reason they would say that is if you're asking them, do these people make $170,000 a year? That's none of your dang business, but if they can afford the house, they can afford the house. All you're asking is, can they afford this house, and what have you collected from them? You know, so, well, I've, I've collected everything except I never got a verification of employment, so we're just waiting on that. Well, I don't know if that guy got fired yesterday, so I'm not going to accept your offer. But, you know, things like that. Any other questions? Did I answer your question? Okay. Um, there was, what was the other? Third party financing, an appraisal addendum. Lenders appraisal. Okay, appraisal addendum. So this one's fun, right? So again, don't forget to put the property in there. Number one, are we fully waiving the appraisal? Oh, let me just quickly point out. I know we went over this a couple of months ago maybe, but just for anybody new or anybody who missed that, we're gonna quickly go over this. Um, please do not use this form if you have an FHA or VA loan. Okay, this particular right to terminate due to the lender's appraisal is only for conventional, only, okay? So are they waiving? A full waiver means that it doesn't matter what it appraises for, they're still, their offer is still what it is. So if they offer you 550,000, it appraises for 500,000, they're gonna pay the cash difference. So it doesn't matter what the appraisal appraises for. This doesn't mean that your buyer can't back out for any reason, but it's a pretty strong 
offer, okay? There are many other reasons to back out of the contract, but they wouldn't be able to back out due to the appraisal because of this, okay? Um, partial waiver. A partial waiver means that they will pay, the, it does, as long as it appraises for this set amount, they'll pay the additional, it doesn't matter what it is. So why would your buyer do that? Or why would a, sell, a buyer's agent submit this to you? Again, 550 is the offer price. Uh, you listed it at 500,000 because you know it'll appraise for 500,000. But as long as it appraises for 510,000, they're gonna pay the difference because they've got 40,000, you know, 40,000. Nope, that's, that's a lie. You listed for 500, they have it on 550. Sorry, I'm getting confused in my head. As long as it appraises for 490, it doesn't matter what else it appraises for. Um, they've got 60,000 in the ca cash to put down on the property. So that's their cap. Now, if you listed at 500 and 550 full appraisal waiver, if it only appraises for 400, they're coming out of pocket 150,000. See how that works? So full waiver, it doesn't matter what you appraise for. They're gonna pay that 550. Partial waiver, as long as it appraises for this much, this is how much cash I have. I have 60 grand in the bank, I can pay 60 grand. This is what I offered, that's what's more than my offer. That's what I can do. Does anybody have questions on partial waiver? So partial waiver, obviously you're not just checking the box, you're checking the box and giving a value, okay? And then additional rights to terminate. In addition to the buyer's right to terminate under paragraph 2B of the third party financing addendum, buyer may terminate the contract within blank amount of days if the appraised value, according to the appraisal obtained by the buyer's lender is less than. So this is, partial waiver, okay, if we did the partial waiver, our example, 500, 550, 490, but we're like, it appraised for 400,000, you can give an additional reason as long as it, if it's less than a certain amount. So if it's less than 450,000, you might be able to, you would put this 450,000 here, okay? This is very situational, so it's hard for me to come up with the situations if I don't know the exact situation but if you guys have questions as to I want to have an additional right to terminate uh, let's talk through your situation and it may be that this particular box works for you okay questions about third-party finance I mean about the waiver of appraisal this particular document is hot right now guys but just be careful with it okay you're, if you're waiving anything, your clients are coming out of pocket more. If they don't have cash, don't bother. All right, HOA. I wanted to go over the HOA addendum only because I've seen a few issues. Okay, the HOA addendum. And it's called the Addendum for Property Subject to Mandatory Membership and a Property Owners Association. Note, this is not for condos. Okay, also the one to four contract is not for condos either. There is a condo contract. So guys, if you're selling a condo, make sure you're using the right documents, okay? This HOA is not for condos. There's in the condo contract, all of this is already addressed because all condos have HOA, okay? So this is uh, concerning this particular address, uh, street address and city, and then this is where you're gonna list the owner's association and the phone number. So if you don't have this information as a buyer's agent, because you wanna turn this in as a buyer's agent in with the offer, because there's money attached to it, okay? Um, if you don't know this, ask the seller's agent. If they don't know, um, research it on MLS. Like when was the next door neighbor's house sold or two houses down sold? What, what did they have on here? What was the owner's association and the, and the phone number? You can put that for now because this can be amended if we needed to do that, okay? Um, so if this particular document is not already uploaded into MLS, which usually it's not because there's money attached, um, you're gonna choose number one, within however many days of the effective date, the seller is gonna deliver the subdivision information to the buyer. Um, once you get the subdivision information, the buyer can terminate within three days after the buyer receives subdivision information or prior to closing, whichever occurs first, and the earnest money will be refunded. So let's just say you purchased a house in an HOA with the intent of renting it out. 
all of a sudden you get the HOA documents and they say no rentals in this neighborhood. All They want all ownership and that's how they're keeping their properties, you know, at their particular value. If you got that, you would have three days at least to um, back out of this contract, get your earnest money back and not worry about the rest of it. Um, okay, number two, within blank days of this effective date of this contract, buyer shall obtain, so this means they don't have the subdivision information. Um, buyer shall obtain, pay for, and deliver a copy of the subdivision information to the seller. If the buyer obtains the subdivision information within the time required, um, the buyer can terminate the contract within three days after the buyer receives the subdivision information. So that this section is exact same as up here. They can, if they pay for it and they get it, then they can back out if, again, their renter can't be a renter or whatever the case is, okay? Number three, the buyer has received and approved subdivi di subdivision information. This means um, we, you know, the seller already uploaded all the HOA docs in MLS and you got them right off the bat. And this says that the buyer does or does not require an update, uh, updated resale certificate. You're almost always gonna be required to obtain an updated resale certificate um, unless you're paying cash. And then if you, you pay cash and nobody requires you to do the resale cert, you're gonna have to do it at some point. So keep that in mind. Um, and then the buyer does not require delivery of subdivision info. Why would this be? Nobody should, you should never check this box. Buyer's always going to require it. Okay, you need to know what's, what your HOA um, stuff is. The title company or its agents is authorized to act on behalf of the parties. So guys, don't freak out if there's an HOA and you're the seller's agent. You don't have to go digging for this. The, the title company does it for you. Okay, this is the part I want to talk about. Material charges, changes. Um, when there's an HOA, you know that resale certificate we were just talking about? HOAs, we always like make fun of them because they're Karens, you know, they require our grass to be cut a certain way or our fence has to be painted or stained a certain color or we can't paint our door or whatever the case is with HOA. On top of that, how do they manage, how do they like hire people to do all this stuff? Well, we pay for them, right? So the HOA is what, $900 a year? That's fine. On top of that, every time they have to print the subdivision information, even if it's just an email, they charge you. So this, they charge you to do association fees, deposits reserved, and change charges associated with the transfer of the party. Um, they charge for everything. So there's a transfer fee, there's a resale cert fee, there's association fees, all of those fees that it costs to change the owner of the home um, can cost up to usually about $500. That's kind of standard, up to $500. This paragraph, as a buyer's agent, says how much you're willing to pay to transfer the fees to you. And you have to put a dollar amount. You, you could, I guess you could put 100% if you push the start, you know, that space button. So if your buyer's willing to put just, I don't care what it costs to transfer, I'll pay 100% of it, that's fine. You can put $300 there, you can put $100 there, you can put $50 there. But whatever the buyer is willing to pay, the seller has to pay the rest. So in this market, you might see how putting 100% or $500 in there might look really attractive to a seller because we nobody knows. I feel like these HOAs just come up with this number every new contract they get. <laughs> um, but anyways, so this is not, you do not in here put how much HOA costs okay that is not the number that you put here so transfer fees okay um, HOA just like taxes is prorated and credited back to the seller and charged to the buyer okay and title does that in their uh, closing disclosure um, and then the last thing is whoever's obtaining it do they have authorization to obtain okay any questions on the HOA or addendum for property subject to mandatory membership in a property owners association? <laughs> what, ha what happens if the amount is more? So let's say we find out that it's five hundred dollars to transfer, but they put six hundred dollars. So you have an influx of. It says up to so oh, okay. prop uh, the transfer fees of the property not to exceed. 
So let's just say you put $600 here and it only costs $500. Your buyer will only be charged $500. And you can see that as the buyer's agent in the uh, closing disclosure. That'll be one of the fees charged to the buyers. So definitely if you're putting like a big number here or 100%, once you get that closing disclosure, check it and make sure you know what your buyer paid, okay? Because they may be like, I didn't know I was gonna pay $1,200. Just because I'm saying it's a $500 standard, that doesn't mean that people aren't getting more and more greedy in the market or you know they're being pressed to deliver faster so they're requiring more money. I don't know, okay? So just be, be mindful that that could be any number, okay? Um, you could always, because you have this subdivision information, you can call them and ask them, how much does your subdivision uh, you know, transfer cost? I'm trying to put in a, an offer. It may take you four days to get an answer, you never know, but <laughs> um, but yeah, it's up to. So if they put in more money, then it's they're only gonna be charged whatever it actually costs. That credit doesn't go to the seller. Okay. All right, any other questions? Bam. All right, so it's been almost an hour, and we were able to get through that pretty quickly. Does anybody have questions? Ah. <laughs> anybody have questions on the one to four, third party, HOA, addendum, appraisal addendum? Are we no. Residential Do you guys want to go over residential lease since we have a few minutes left? Anybody? I'm going to do it. Let's do it. Do it. Do it. Do it. All right. Seller's temporary residential lease. If anybody on Google Meet needs to jump off, I totally understand. I added one. So we've got 10 minutes to one. Might as well go through it. All right. Parties. The buyer tenant is not. So if you're the buy, if you're the seller's agent and you need a lease back, you're no longer the buyer tenant. You're now, you're not the landlord anymore. You're the tenant, okay? So if you click into the box, it tells you who it is. This is the buyer, tenant, subtenant, but you're the landlord. If you're the seller, landlord, or sub-landlord, you're actually considered the tenant, okay? That's a little bit confusing. The lease, make sure that you put the full address here. Terminates. So you're usually going to know what day your contract closes, right? Because contracts have a closing date. So if they, if they close on um, April 30th and you need a one month lease back, this may you know, terminate on the 28th or whatever the case is. Okay, so make sure you put a date here. You can amend this later if you need to. Rental. So the tenant shall pay the landlord as rental. Blank amount of money per day. Right now, it's very common to put zero, um, or even I've seen 50 cents, a dollar, uh, because it's a negotiation tactic, right? Makes your buyer look better the less it is. Uh, but in the past, you may have seen um, like the amount that they think their payment, their monthly payment's going to be, divided by 30 days. So if they know their monthly payment was going to be $2,600, you would divide that by 30 days and you would put, you know, so that's 86.66666. You might put $90 a day or $100 a day. Um, just because they're trying to cover, you know, the buyers all of a sudden have a, they have a mortgage to pay. So they may put money here. But it has been a negotiation tactic because keep in mind that your buyers actually don't pay their mortgage until the first full month. So if you close on April 14th, your first payment isn't due till June 14th. So you kind of are living there until June 14th without paying anything additional, okay? Deposit. Um, I've seen everything from zero to $5 lately, um, but you could do $50, $500, whatever you want, okay? This is all about the buyer and what they want to see here. Uh, utilities, I always put current utilities, okay? Because Tenant is going to have to pay all their uh, all their utilities except actually I'm sorry this is none it's current pets I always put none there's no additional utilities they're going to pay they're just going to pay all of their current utilities okay uh, so you don't want your new buyer who just owned this house renting it back to the seller to have to pay for the water bill 
Um, pets, I always, this says tenants may not keep pets on the property except, uh, that's where I put current pets because, you know, whatever pets are already living there, they're not gonna do worse than what they've already done. If they have current pets and you know they do, that might be a reason you put a deposit down on paragraph five. Special provisions, I always put on here to have the house professionally cleaned when they move out. For me, I just prefer that because I don't want to deal with people's, you know, like, I don't want them just to move out and then I have a messy house because I didn't get to do a walkthrough because we've already purchased the house. I already paid for the house. They're just staying there additional time. Um, we'll leave that alone. Holdover. Holdover means, okay, so you had uh, this particular contract's going to end on May 30th. If they stay until June 5th, and they didn't ask you to change the date, that's called a holdover. It means they're just staying there without terminating or amending the lease. So how much per day do you charge for holdover? Well, if my contract, you know, if my mortgage is me $90 a day, I'm charging you $200 a day to holdover. Because now, how long is it gonna take me to get you out of this property? And am I gonna have to uh, evict you? Think, think about those things, okay? Always make the holdover something that'll hurt someone because this is a contract. You don't want them just to stay because they, you put zero. Um, and it doesn't hurt them if they really do plan on getting out of the house, right? So make sure your holdover is, you know, 200, 250. I've even seen up to three or 350 per day. Um, so you just don't want it to be easy to hold over. And that's it. Landlord is the contact information. Tenant is the contact information. So landlord would be the buyer. Tenant is a seller. I do not CC myself in this information because once I leave the transaction, I don't want this tenant calling me to call their agent to call them. Everybody's information needs to be here so that they can talk to each other after the transaction closes, okay? Because this agreement is between the two of them. All right, any questions about that? Cool, looks like we got through that one too. All right, guys. Well, that's all the addendum and contracts that we're going to go to. Thank you for hanging out with me for an hour. And you guys have a wonderful rest of your day. Bye. Oh, uh, wind down Wednesdays tomorrow. <laughs>